welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Dr. Keith Welchie. Keith is the Vice President and Chief Medical Informatics Officer at Freighter Health and Associate Dean for Clinical Informatics at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He's a professor of medicine and infectious diseases and remains active in patient care. Dr. Welchie has a background in both medicine and medical informatics, holding an MD and PhD from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He has worked in various roles in the field, including in infection prevention and informatics before becoming a chief medical informatics officer. Dr. Welchie's research interests are in the application of medical informatics tools to automate surveillance, as well as clinical decision support to reduce adverse events events and improve care. Dr. Welchi, Keith, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's amazing having you on. You have such an impressive track record and academic record. You spent, I think, 18 years in school and have been teaching throughout your entire career. And I think from my research, I saw you completed your doctorate in biochemistry while obtaining your MD. And so I had kind of a two-part question. One, I'm wondering, is that common? And then two, what drew you to medicine in the first place? Yeah, well, I, I think MD PhD programs are increasingly common, less less so back when I did it. You know, I saw a group on in the newspaper and figured what the what the heck. <laughs> no. Um, actually the my interest in medicine goes back to when I was in grade school and I can't really explain it. My I have no family in medicine other than my my dad was a pharmacist and he was the only person in his family to go to college. My mom didn't go to college, so it's not like we had a professional background, but I if I attribute it to anything, it's some books that were in my grade school library. One was on the history of surgery, and one was on the history of uh, infectious diseases. And I just found both of those books really interesting. And and so ever since like fifth or sixth grade, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, and seemed to work out. Yeah. My uh, I, I was you know sort of a nerdy kid, liked uh, liked science, and was a biochemistry major in in college. And when I found out about the MD-PhD programs, was had done some summer research opportunities in labs and, and just thought that that would be really interesting and I actually planned on a career in more bench science as an MD-PhD. It was during my fellowship as an ID fellow that I learned about epidemiology. I was one of my faculty mentors at the time was the hospital epidemiologist at Barnes Hospital. And I thought what she did was really interesting. And so made the difficult decision to change from focusing on basic science to doing more clinical research and epidemiology. I'm much glad I did, but it was uh, part of it was easier because my PhD mentor had always said that getting a PhD isn't trade school. You're not learning a set of specific skills. Mm -hmm. You're learning how to think and to apply, you know, rigorous thinking to problems. So I never regret the years I spent in the lab because I think it was enormously helpful in thinking through problems in a rigorous way. You know, Keith, uh, whatever grade school this is where your kids uh, have to read about um, the history of surgery, I want to send my kids there in the future. So I'm going to ask you <laughs> afterwards what school you went to. <laughs> but uh, how did you end up in medical informatics? Like, where did that interest come from? Yeah, so again, growing up, I grew up in, was in the 70s went to college in the early 80s when, you know, com personal computers were really starting to boom. We didn't have one. We couldn't af afford one. My high school didn't have any. And I went to a liberal arts college where they didn't really have much there. But I always thought computers were interesting. I used to look at them at Radio Shack and kind of always wanted one. It was actually my last semester of college. I'd already been accepted into medical school, um, into the MD-PhD program. But I had a free elective and, and thought of there was a program, one program in class throughout the entire college is in Pascal. And so I decided to take that for something interesting. And I absolutely just loved it. I just thought it was so interesting. And so that got me very interested in, much more interested in computers. But my graduate school, my MD PhD program, again, didn't have a lot of informatics there at the time. There was one course about using computers in research. And, and I, I took that and it was really interesting. So I, I started doing some programming to support my research, just some little one-off programs to make things easier in the lab, but really didn't know that clinical informatics was a field until I was uh, an ID fellow. Like I said, I was doing informatics, was doing epidemiology. The CDC had a program called EpiInfo that 
helped with that, that you could do some rudimentary programming in. And I was actually teaching classes and how to use that. And then discovered that uh, there was this whole field around how to use healthcare data and um, improve care through the use of technology called clinical informatics. I was able to take a course through the National Library of Medicine that really decided me to, that that's where I wanted to go. Before that though, I was sort of that geeky person who carried a Palm Pilot to keep my patient list and things like that. So I always had an interest in technology, but like I said, once I found out informatics was an actual field, I really pursued that. Random question for you, Keith, you know, with how much data and informatics keeps evolving nowadays, it's getting so large and complex. Like, do you ever foresee a future where you actually need to have a formal medical residency in clinical informatics, as opposed to right now, where typically you pick a specialty and then you may pursue clinical informatics afterwards. Are we ever going to get to that point, do you think? Well, we're somewhat there already, right? There's fellowship programs in clinical informatics. So there is still a practice pathway for people who came up like I did, just sort of learning by experience. But because it's so broad and diverse, you know, there are now fellowships in clinical informatics for people to learn all the pieces they need to learn because it is it is complicated and can take a long time otherwise. So I, I think that's that is helpful. You know, just like other areas, though I think you know we what we don't do a good job at in most curriculums is is teaching some informatics information as, as part of medical school curricula. So I you know I think there's a lot of medical school curricula are still very much focused on a lot of time on basic science, which is probably more detailed than most physicians need. Hmm. And we could spend that time better on, you know, other issues like epidemiology, patient safety, informatics that are of more practical value. But, you know, that's, that's my opinion. I know, you know, curricula are evolving. Hmm. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm still trying to get over the fact that you said Pascal and love in the same sentence, but <laughs> I, I'm curious, Keith, um, much, much of your work over the last two decades has really centered around patient quality, safety, and infection prevention. I'm curious today where it's so prevalent, but why are these themes so important to you and how do you see informatics as potentially a field to impact these three themes on a greater scale? Yeah, so I, I actually count myself fortunate the way I got into informatics and I was a, a hospital epidemiologist and then became of infection prevention for a health system, which got me into the broader realms of quality and safety. And so, you know, the, that idea of doing no harm, you know, is, which is really baked into us in medical school, that plays out in a broader way with, with patient safety and quality. You know, how do we improve the care we're giving and it's sort of a meta issue, right? When you're taking care of an individual patient, you know you're helping them. When when you implement a quality program and see that the number of adverse events is you know dramatically reduced, we had a program at when I was at BJC Healthcare that that over 10 years we had a 75% reduction in, in harm events. So I know you know thousands of patients, tens of thousands of patients were helped. But I just don't know which ones, right? There's no way of knowing which specific patients you help. So you have to take satisfaction in that sort of conceptual improvement. Um, but it's clear that with with technology that can really help implement these things, right? Reminders for implementing BTE orders or better, just even better order sets to, to make it easy to do the right thing. I'm very enamored of the notion of the learning health system where we take all this data that we have and our medical scientists, you know, use that to help understand how do we improve care? What problems are there? Can we implement better solutions? And then once you know that, feeding that back into the electronic health record in the form of decision support. And then by decision support, I don't mean pop-ups, which is what a lot of people first mm -hmm. think of. And the, those BPAs and Epic Talk or alerts are really the last thing you want. That's the last thing you need is to complete an action and then be told, oh, you did the wrong thing. What we really need is proactive decision support by having smart order sets, right? If I'm an ID doc, so I always think of ID examples. If I know my patient is coming in for meningitis, I know the indication, I know how old they are, I know their weight, I know their creatinine. So the computer should just suggest to the provider, this is the right dose of vancomycin for this indication, right? It shouldn't let them him or her write the order and then say, oh, you, you, 
you wrote the wrong dose. It, it should tee it up and say, do you agree? And 99% of the times that should be the right dose. Like we never want to have a situation where we don't let the provider have an override. There may be a compelling reason to override it because the computer's knowledge is never perfect. But for the vast majority of times, we should just tee the right thing up for the provider. And that'll be more and more important as we get into personalized medicine and genomics, right? That no one can keep track of everything. We need to tee up this information in a way that's easy for the provider to provide the best possible care to patients. So I think leveraging technology to improve patient care and outcomes is really great, a great use of uh, what's there. Keith, a question for you about informatics. I think, you know, one of the things that can be challenging in a complex healthcare environment is getting adoption of, you know, informatics or technology tools in such an incredibly busy clinical workflow. I'm curious, are there like one or two key strategies that have worked best for your teams on like reducing friction to adoption and sustainment of kind of new tools? Yeah, you're absolutely right. That's, it is a, a challenge. And like I said, that what we need to do is to make it easier for our providers and our clinicians. So not just the physicians and APPs, but our nurses, our MAs, everybody, by embedding those support tools into their natural workflows instead of taking them out of their workflow or stopping them, really embedding them. And so that's what we're aiming to do, but it's hard. It takes a lot of effort. I'm fortunate here at, at Freighter in the Medical College of Wisconsin, there is recognition that this takes work and we have resources we're setting up a provider informaticist program, recognizing we need that specialty input. We need neurologists helping other neurologists or urologists helping other urologists to figure out what should our documentation templates look like? What should our order sets be to make them easy and easy to personalize so that we can really have that domain expertise to make that use of technology as seamless as possible? Um, so it, it is basically just something where it takes a lot of effort to do right. I think a lot of the tools are there, it's, but it is a lot of work to get them implemented in a smart way. Yeah, I guess it goes back to technology is the, is the relatively easy part. It's the change management. That's always the, the toughest piece. Last year, 2022, at the Chime Fall Forum, I saw you speak about implementing new innovations, and you were pretty strong on the idea that there should always be clear success metrics for a new innovation. And if the data shows that the innovation just isn't working, it's okay to turn it off. And I was wondering why might healthcare teams sometimes get in the habit of letting failed innovations just continue? And how do we get folks in healthcare comfortable with the idea of just turning off innovations that sometimes fail? Yeah, that is, that is a challenge. And it gets back to your earlier comment that it's all about change management. So one, there's a notion that failure in medicine is unacceptable. We always have to be right. So there is sort of, sort of a mindset that says we can't accept failure. And often once you've, you know, everyone wants to be innovative. So many health systems have innovation centers or innovation labs or innovation, this or that. And that's great. I'm not dismissing the importance of trying to continue to innovate what we do. But we do need to have recognition that not everything works, right? And there's that recognition in Silicon Valley, that notion of fail fast, fail forward, learn from what your mistakes and keep moving. But our natural predilections in healthcare are that failure is not acceptable. So we keep trying to just tweak it to make it work better. But I think if you think about our clinical analogies, a lot of times we actually, we do have failures in, in medicine that are considered perfectly acceptable, right? We start someone on a hypertensive regimen, we'll say, we'll start this dose and if that doesn't work, we'll increase the dose. And if that doesn't work, we'll, we'll change to a different regimen. And so we have to get, I think, clinicians to thinking like, this is no different, right? You you wouldn't continue with a failed hypertensive regimen or keep just increasing the dose to make it work, right? Sometimes you just have to back up and try something different. And so we do need to make that notion of we're learning from this. It's not a failure in the sense, as long as we learn something from it, but we do need to define up front what's working and what's not because our clinicians, our providers get used to the workflow and they don't want to change again. So it's always about, God, you're going to make me change again. I was just getting used to this and now I have to stop doing it. I have to do something else. And so there is a certain amount of change management, but I think it's critically important that we, because we only have so many resources and we should really be focusing on things that are that are working instead of constantly trying to beat into submission of a failed workflow or a failed innovation. 
And again, we should also not look at it as failure. We should look at it as learning, right? The whole Edison quote took me a hundred times to make a light bulb that worked. The first 99, it, they weren't failures. They were learning <laughs> what not to do or something like that. It's really hard though, because it's not in the DNA, I think, of healthcare to say, you know, we're going to fail a fair amount of time and, and that's okay. I, I think some some other thoughts that come to mind, what you said, I mean, one is that sometimes interventions only work for certain populations. So it could be that some of these novel informatics or technology tools work for certain specialties or situations, but not others. And then also sometimes the technology or innovation actually works to your point, but maybe there's a compliance issue because of change management or workflows. And if we just got that right, the impact would be there. But I love that analogy to like other clinical interventions. Like we we understand failure there, but why not with other situations like innovation? That's such a really great comparison. I love that. Yeah, I think it's important. You bring out a good point that when we were doing that assessment of is this intervention working to make sure we're doing our due diligence to say, yes, it's working in some places, it's not working in others. For example, at our place is we've recently implemented what it's a nuances DAX product or digital voice, and there's others out there. Um, and we've actually had a, a fair number of providers who started it, stop using it. But rather than just say it's a failure, we actually did look. And there are certain characteristics of what made for those providers who are successful, they love it. And they are like wildly enthusiastic. So we don't want to just turn it off wholesale. We did the due diligence to say, here's the kind of provider that it works really well for. And these other kinds of providers, if you were super efficient with the keyboard and mouse already in Epic and you had all your dot phrases and all that, a, a DAX solution probably isn't going to make you any more solution efficient. Mm -hmm. But if you were someone who already did a lot of dictating and you're not good with the keyboard, or then this might be a great solution for you. So we're trying to be more selective in role, as we roll out this um, digital ex audio experience to make sure that the providers who are starting it are the ones who are going to stick with it because there is a learning curve both for the provider and then for the AI. And so, you know, to be successful, you have to have the right kind of provider paired with the technology. So it's not an all or none. And your point's a great one that you really have to focus on sometimes it's subpopulations and not think of it as an all or none. Actually, Keith, on the ambient voice topic, I mean, it's very timely because we're trying to, you know, improve the staff experience and minimize documentation effort. Um, and cut down on burnout. I've talked to some CMIOs who said that even though often the solution is pitched as a way to increase throughput of patients, often the, the real value is around improving staff, staff satisfaction, less pajama time documenting, going home sooner. I'm curious so far for you, like where have been the biggest benefits for the clinicians? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. For our, for our providers who really like it, those have been the benefits, right? We're, we are not pitching this as a way to increase throughput, but it's a it's a better experience for the provider and often for the patient to is that discussions going on in the room and being captured. So I, I think it would be a mistake to sell it to the CEO or the C suite as a way to generate revenue. But you know, if you're reducing turnover in your providers, that's a huge cost savings, right? Recruiting providers is very expensive. So it's not that there's not a return, it's just the return is maybe not quite so black and white. When you rolled that out, did you start with like a very small number of specialties or how did you think about like rolling that out? Yeah, we started with just a few specialties and providers who, you know, want, wanted to try it. And again, the initial criteria were just if people who were willing, right? So, you know, a lot of people have that early adopter mindset and want to try things. But again, in, in retrospect, not all of them were ideal candidates for this because they were already very efficient. And so this wasn't likely to add much to their workflows, but we learned, right? So we did, we did learn, we did evaluate. And like I said, now we're trying to be a little more focused on the kinds of providers we think it'll be most beneficial for. I appreciate that flexibility and scope, how it can change once you get new data presented. Keith, I wanted to switch gears a little bit. At the same Chimes Fall Forum last year, you posted a tweet saying we need to make telehealth easier to access. And I think that's absolutely important. I'm curious, what are some of the prevalent challenges that we're faced with access today? And maybe what are some strategies that healthcare leaders can use to move the needle on patient access? 
Yeah, patient, it, it is a it is a challenge, and some of it's just the technology, right? The the clunkiness of our user interfaces, and I, and more organizations are making improvements. Companies are making improvements to make the just the ability to log into the telehealth visit easier and it's more seamless. You know, the ability to invite others to a visit so that if you need, you know, if your mother's having a visit and you want to be there because she's may have cognitive issues or whatever, so you can help. Being able to do that is, is getting easier with the technology, but there's still room to go. And I, and I think the other part is that we need to think about these visits in terms of a, of a continuum of care, right? So um, how do we get the right care to a patient in the right place at the right time? Sort of like those, kind of like the CDS five rights. There's always these rights. What kind of care does the patient need? Is this a scheduled video, video visit or an ad hoc for a problem? Do you even need a video visit? Could this be something more asynchronous? So there's been a lot of ha-ha uh, around some health systems looking to charge for my chart messages where they're complicated. And I think that's really more a reflection on the reimbursement system in the US. If, if we had a comprehensive sort of population care model, we'd be encouraging patients to use asynchronous care, right? Just to have a question answered or where we don't need that real-time video visit. You could imagine then a continuum where you could message somebody and saying, you know, I've I've got a rash, I need to see somebody and getting that asynchronous video visit. And then depending on how worrisome it is, saying, oh, you need to be seen in person. And then again, having that facilitated so that they can have a same day spot with their primary care provider's office, or if that's not available, having urgent care is readily available in their community to where they could be seen when they need to be seen. But again, if it can be handled with a video visit, they don't need to be. Or in follow-up care, right? Post-surgical care, a lot of wound checks could easily be handled by video visits. So how do we facilitate being thoughtful around what kind of care is needed in scheduling that level of care for the convenience of the patient and then also the provider? So it's really as much about being thoughtful around workflows, but then also you know, implementing the, making sure that the tools we have are easier. We're, we're trying to make it easier in our EHR to, for the provider to schedule a follow-up visit as a video visit so that it's just there as part of their workflow. They don't have to do anything extra to step out of their existing workflow and think about, you know, doing extra steps to make a follow-up a, a video visit when it's appropriate. Keith, I had a thought. Um... You know, for a lot of like primary care and population health programs, there's increasingly a team-based model approach where maybe through like, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, it doesn't have to be the physician doing the first interaction. It could be a nurse practitioner or another allied health provider. And if it's, if it warrants escalation to the physician, then great. But, you know, trying to let everyone operate at the top of their license. I'm curious for, for specialties like ID, or surgery or others where typically these are more very, you know, narrow, more complex conversations. Do you think it's possible to get to more of a team-based like virtual model where, you know, instead of having every post-op follow-up go through the surgeon first, you in, can can have a team-based model or are you finding even let's say for ID that it's complicated enough that it really has to be an ID physician all the time who's taking that first interaction, synchronous or asynchronous? Yeah, no, I think a team-based care applies broadly, I think. Again, it depends on the exact situation, but a lot of follow-up is actually pretty rote. You think about infectious diseases, HIV care is very amenable to team-based care and a lot of routine follow-up for patients who are compliant, their counts are good and all that. That could easily be a video visit with, with you know, an APP or, you know, they, not doesn't even need a provider. Although again, our current reimbursement models don't support that, but but, you know, really just to look and say, you know, you're not having symptoms from your meds, your viral load is completely suppressed, your CD4 count looks great. You don't need an advanced degree <laughs> to be able to do that. But, you, you know, you want to make sure the patient also has an opportunity to ask questions or things that are top of mind that they may not be willing to do with, with someone other than a, a provider. So I think there is a lot of care that can be provided in a team-based approach. And like you said, have everyone operate at the top of license and then escalate as necessary. What I, what I have seen in some places, which I think is backwards, is the physicians are fully booked. And so when a patient has an acute problem 
and call. They get squeezed in to see um, one of the APPs sometimes. And it seems to me that's sort of the, the inverse of what you want, right? A lot of routine care, right, routine blood pressure follow-up or CHF or whatever is, is very amenable to APPs or people who are really skilled, you know, HIV care. They know their area really well where you probably need someone at the top of the license chain is for weird problems, right? That's that's where all of that extra training in medical school and all that to think broadly about differentials is probably more necessary. So I think right now, a lot of the way we squeeze in those same day visits or whatever, we should be having the physician seeing more of those and a lot of the routine care, even routine post-op or subspecialty care you know, diabetes care, whatever, it's, it's very amenable to team-based care with, you know, diabetes nurse educators can do a lot of diabetes care that doesn't need a, an APP or a, or a physician. So I think there are good potential models out there. Again, right now, a lot of that's creative thinking is probably hampered more by the reimbursement models than by the necessity of the care delivery. But besides the reimbursement challenges, do you think at all part of it is there's a historical culture around the direct patient physician relationship. And a lot of patients are almost like expecting to talk to the doctor. And that's why we haven't yet seen as much of a movement towards leveraging more of our APP and other clinical partners to, to handle some of the routine care, or is that maybe not so much an issue today? Yeah, I think, no, that's a great point. I think that it probably is right. Cause we're, and we're seeing that in our clinics where some patients don't want a video visit. They want to be seen by the doctor. And some of that is, will change over time as people, you know, as, as our patients and populations get used to more team-based care. And I, th I think there's even ways to continue to incorporate that sort of check-in with the physician, even if the bulk of the care is delivered by an, an APP or even, like I said, a, a non-provider or someone like a diabetes nurse educator, you know, to say, do you have any questions? Do you, you know, do you have anything that you need to talk to the doctor about or talk to a provider about? So I think there are ways to incorporate that into a, a workflow that's still, you know, we're, we're short on providers in this country. So we need to leverage every opportunity to, to not use the provider's time unnecessarily, but we still want to address the concerns of the patient and make sure they feel like they're getting their questions answered or have the opportunity to make contact with a provider. Yeah, I've got to think, like, even if I met with an APP, but then Dr. Welchi sent a note saying, hey, I checked in on it. I'm good with the plan. Like I'd, I'd feel good about that, but that's just me. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so, and that's where we need to be, right? That's some of that. will, as we get into, like I said, personalized medicine and all that, what are the patient's expectations? And we, again, right now we, so much of our interaction is based on a single model for everybody, but we're starting to change that. Right. So some of our, especially our complicated patients, chronic conditions, we're recognizing that as we develop care teams and have care coordinators, that you know, some patients need more of a high touch than others or, or want more of a high touch than others. And those team-based models can accommodate that more readily. You could imagine that for that patient who really wants that review, to, the, the team can say, oh, Dr. Liu, can you go see Mrs. Jones now? She just wants to touch base or you know, tee up the you know, that's what, what an electronic system can do, right? It should tee up those, here's the four patients that were seen yesterday that you need to just send a note to because we know they, they're expecting that. And other patients who like could care less, then, you know, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we do need to be more personalized to addressing the concerns of and the needs of specific patients. I love the idea Like you're basically extending personalized medicine beyond just personalized medical treatment to really personalize like whole person care. That's, it's a really, really great concept. Yeah. And taking into account patient preference as well. I love that. So Keith, we've come a long way since EMRs, since paper charting, you know, we're starting to optimize the EHR, but there are definitely some systems out there that are either consolidating systems right now, or even transitioning to a, a new provider for their health record system. And you actually recently published an abstract in the Journal of Patient Experience, examining the impacts of transitioning EHRs. What were some of your main findings and what could be done to mitigate any negative effects? Yeah, so that was our analytics team really took the lead on that to take the opportunity as we were changing EHRs at our health, my previous health system 
to look at what that impact is because every health system is very focused on the pacing experience, the HCAPs and the CAPS scores that really weighs into a lot of your rankings and thinking about what is the impact then if you're changing EHRs. There are some studies out there looking at patient surveys and all that, asking them their experience, but really the impact of scores hasn't been looked at much. And because we had a staggered approach, it was a fairly sophisticated analytics problem of looking at the impact at each hospital as it went live in, in this staggered way. And, and what we found, probably not surprisingly, is that during the, the first couple of months after the go live, a lot of our patient experience scores went down. Nurse communication, provider communication, our patients, uh, I think, perceived probably correctly that the nurses and providers, the care team was being somewhat distracted, right? They're learning new technology. They're probably swearing at the computer, who knows what else. But, and, and so that was picked up and reflected in, this, in the scores, right? Because we know that patient satisfaction scores aren't always so much about that specific questions. It's about their overall perceptions of the, the care they got. And so we did see dips in our score. The good news was that within a couple of months, all of our scores returned to baseline. So, you know, as our, as our care providers learn how to use the EHR, even though it was, was different, they were, you know, back up to providing the same level of care as perceived by our patients. So that was good to confirm. We, that was our hope that we would rebound. And from our provider side, the satisfaction with the EHR was higher than with our historical EHRs. From the patient's perspective, I don't know that it, it impacted that as much. We heard a lot of good feedback. We went on to Epic. A lot of patients really liked my chart as a global satisfier, but that's not going to impact their HCAP scores, right? Because that's not what the questions are about. And that's sort of after the fact. So, but we did return to baseline. In terms of what lessons to take from that, I think probably not a lot you can do, right? I don't, I don't know that we could have avoided that, that dip. I mean, we could have told our, our care providers to not show frustration with the new EHR in front of the patients, but you know, that's not gonna, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna be helpful. So um, I, I think the biggest lesson is that, you know, very quickly those scores rebounded. So it's basically, don't worry about it. <laughs> like, okay. you, know, you, you know, you may have, take a, a, a temporary hit, but if you do it right, it, you should very quickly come back to your, your baseline reflecting whatever care processes you were doing. And our scores were pretty good in general mm -hmm. beforehand. Yeah continue to be after the fact. Right. Plus a better clinician experience. It sounds like it was net positive. Right. So that's really great. So another topic is switching gears again, but there, there is another topic that I know you're passionate about. You actually were the author is another abstract that I pulled, but it was from the IEEE Journal of Biomedical and Health Informatics. So this is about black box versus conversational machine learning and what it means to migrate between those two. And so I'm curious, just for myself, really, and our audience, what is conversational machine learning and how could it transform how we're applying machine learning in the future? Yeah, that was a great project, really led by uh, Josh Swamidas at, at WashU and his, his lab. But thinking about, again, you know, how do we leverage technology to improve patient care and use all the data we have? And so AI is becoming very prevalent. What the conversation Josh and I were having is, We've, we've got all this data. We, we, one of our initiatives in the health system, like many health systems, was, was reducing VTEs. And so the question was, you know, what, what do we know about VTEs? I mean, there's some things, you know, you give heparin, you put on compression stockings, but there are other things that we might find out about, like combinations of medicines, you know, very complex patterns that might put a patient at risk or, or Pure VTEs, and, and so that's what we we did as a project, use data from our EHRs, and applied AI approaches to investigating. You know, were there medications that perhaps reduce the risk of VTEs other than the ones we we think, or other factors? And I think that the approach that Josh's lab took, and, and the real novelty there was, you know, recognizing that for for providers. A black box approach is often resisted, right? We don't we don't trust the information because we don't know what went into it. And in a black box approach where everything is just sort of throw everything into the computer, turn the crank, and you get an answer out, it's also potentially subject to a lot of, of bias that may not be in, immediately apparent. 
So this notion of the conversational approach is to, to do more iterative machine learning um, where we're looking at different factors, you know, like one that immediately comes to mind is, you know, someone who has cancer versus not. We know that a lot of cancer patients have hypercoagulable states. And looking at the models that the computer is generating, working with our subject matter experts, both in terms of clinical areas like oncology, but also in anticoagulation, to say what makes sense, what doesn't, what's probably a, a confounder of the, of the results versus something that's truly interesting or, or what may be, you know, what may be a surrogate variable for, for a known risk factor. And that's why it's popping out. And so really doing that iterative, iterative approach to machine learning to account for all of the variables in a way that then generates a, an answer that providers can feel confident in. And with that approach, you know, we actually found that, it, that patients who were getting on Dancitron were significantly less likely to get a VTE than others. And there's some, there's some physiology behind that to make it plausible, but it was a novel finding. And there was a bit of a dose response curve. And again, p- potentially confounded by the fact that a lot of chemo patients get on Dancitron, but even that we were able to account for looking at oncology and non-oncology populations. So I think the finding was interesting, but really the approach Josh took of this, what he calls conversational AI, where it was this iterative process, uh, working with the subject matter experts to tease out the models and the potential risk factors that the models were suggesting to say, yeah, we know that already, or no, that, yeah, that risk factor is actually a surrogate for this other thing that we know. And then through that, accounting for all the variables that we needed to, to have confidence that the final outcome was real. I'm curious, like, you know, given the proliferation of, or at least potential for AI machine learning to impact healthcare, I know, I know a lot of folks that we talk to see kind of more of the like automating workflow and non-clinical tasks as a low hanging fruit task that won't potentially disrupt or, or hurt patient care. And it's a good starting point, but at some point we want to escalate to figure out what's the value of AI machine learning for clinical care, which is way more complicated. Okay. I'm just curious from an ID perspective, is there anything in infectious disease that you're most excited about potential use cases for applying AI machine learning? Yeah, actually some of the very early modeling for EHRs, like the help system in Utah, focused on surfacing potential risk factors for ID issues or potential, you know, microorganisms or with clinical scenarios maybe appropriate antibiotic regimens given likely risk factors. So there's a long history of ID being used as an example use case for, for the EHRs and clinical decision support. But right now there's not nothing in particular. I think a lot of those areas have, have been well explored. I think for, for me that I think some of the most exciting areas for AI and machine learning are in more of the visual applications, so radiology for like lung cancer detection and mammography, and then there are lots of reports about like screening for diabetic retinopathy and using machine learning for for that. And again, I think sometimes we we let the perfect be the enemy of the good in some of these things where, you know, like the diabetic retinopathy screening, it's not, if you think about the use cases and the global shortage of, of ophthalmologists, the question isn't whether the machine learning is as good as a trained ophthalmologist. The, the question is, is it better than what's currently available to most patients? So if we could, again, use those models to, to hone down who needs to be seen by an ophthalmologist, then, then globally we're, we're better off. So again, sometimes we worry too much about, well, what if someone's missed? You know, the liability, and this again gets to our, how our health system works here. Everyone's worried about liability. But if you had no screening, you're worse off, right? So if, if you had screening and it missed something, that's bad. But if you if you hadn't been screened at all, you would have also been missed. So are you really, you know, worse off at the individual level and isn't at the population level, the vast majority of people are so much better off by this kind of automated screening. So again, some of it is how we think about problems here based mm-hmm. on our medical legal framework and our reimbursement models. Um, but I think right. those vision type of AI and machine learning models are very exciting. 
It's a great point. I think sometimes we we get so focused on what's the internal risk to the care delivery system, but we forget about what's the total societal benefit of that change. If you were to ask most patients, hey, are you okay with the small amount of risk if it means that the total benefit, faster access, et cetera, was there, most would probably be in favor of the total societal benefit, but we often don't even get to have that conversation. I think that's a really great point. So Keith, here I am just changing gears on all of our topics, but uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on this outside of your day-to-day responsibilities. Uh, you're also a judge with the FLL Robotics League and appear to be a robotics hobbyist yourself. And I just wanted to put this tidbit in because I was a competitor in the FLL back in grade school. And it's so cool to me that you, you know, you've been a judge all this time. And I'm curious, how did you first get involved with FLL Robotics and where did your interest in robotics come from? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so for those who don't know, FLL stands for First Lego League. And it's a, it's a partnership with the FIRST Foundation, which is a, a U.S. educational foundation who really wants to get kids involved in science and technology, um, you know, STEM programs and, and with Lego, obviously. To, to build robots out of Legos using the Lego Mindstorms, and now they have a new system, which the name's escaping me. Mm-hmm. And so the, the FLL program is really aimed at um, sort of fourth through eighth graders in, in the U.S. Um, to, to build robots, which they program to run autonomously, right? So they, again, for those not familiar, there's a, there's a game table with Lego props, and the robot has to be programmed to navigate the table and do certain actions like press a lever or, or pull something or move a piece, you know, pick up a piece and move it. So there's a, a lot of technology involved, both learning how to program, but also learning how to think strategically around which missions get me the most points and how can I minimize the number of attachments I need to accomplish the most missions. And so really thought provoking. I started when my kids were in grade school and this their school wanted to start a team and they didn't have a know of anybody wanted to be a coach, but one of the moms knew that I was, again, kind of a ner- nerdy person and so asked me if I'd be interested in coaching. And so I coached for a number of years until my kids aged out of the program and then became a judge once I was no longer coaching. And I've enjoyed it so much that I've continued to do it both for the first Lego League, but also at the high school level and the first tech challenge, because it's really exciting to see these young people, you know, get interested in science and technology and even, you know, you might consider it more engineering focused, but again, I, I see it, my mentor about the PhD program, this isn't about learning a specific set of, of skills that are non-transferable. This is around, you know, how to think about problems critically. You know, how do we solve these problems? There's multiple ways to do it. How do we assess which ones are the most efficient? And so learning those critical thinking skills, I think is really the key to that and sets these kids up for success, not just in engineering and computer science, but really in, in lots of fields. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And actually, uh, as a follow-up to that, I'm curious to get your thoughts on robotics and surgery, because I know that's you know one actual practical application of where robotics is in medicine today. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, th- again, this is a, a great application of technology to improving patient care. I think sometimes it's people like to just apply to technology even if there's no benefit because they like technology. But here, I think we're seeing real benefits in patient care in you know, doing minimally invasive surgery and doing very finely detailed surgery that may not be possible without the use of a, a robot. The robot can dampen out unnecessary hand movements and, and you know, can make the surgery more precise. I think an exciting area, again, thinking about our, our global shortage of, of providers and that, you know, making sure patients get access to the best care they need is telerobotic surgery, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're somewhere in rural Wyoming or, you know, someplace, do you really need to travel hundreds of miles to a specialty center to see, you know, the, the surgeon who does this particular kind of surgery? Or can we get to a point where you can go into your local hospital and get more advanced surgery by a, by a you know, subspecialist who's working remotely and if, because a lot of the post-op care and all that's pretty straightforward. It's not, it's no different than other surgeries, but, but for certain things that you want very specialized surgeons to, to do that. And so again, I see this as a way to make care more accessible across the country and you know, across the globe. There've been some examples of that. And 
you know, as we have more and more bandwidth, it certainly makes it easier to think about the future where we are able to do that kind of surgery. Yeah, that's very fascinating. Yeah. So Keith, just being mindful of your time, we're going to flip over to what we call the fast five lightning round. This is just five questions to get to know you better. The first question we have, what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? Yeah, I have lots of favorite books, but probably the book I recommend the most to people is Sourdough by Robin Sloan. Mm -hmm. Just because it's a, it's a short book. It's fun. It's about a woman in the Silicon Valley who's a roboticist mm -hmm. who turns into a sourdough maker. And it's, it's just a fun book about human interactions. And like I said, it's an easy, easy summer vacation read, but uh, Robin Sloan's a great writer. So I enjoy all of his books. I love it. Question two, who is a person either dead or alive you'd love to meet? Yeah, I, I, William Gibson, the mm -hmm. science fiction writer. And I would love to meet him because he's one of my favorite writers but he has a couple of my favorite phrases. One is, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Mm. And another line from one of his books is, um, the street always finds its own uses for things. And his novels are very spare in some ways, but in other ways he builds worlds. But really a lot of the content is focused on not technology per se, but on people and how mm. they use technology sort of as an incidental, right? So that's that whole, the street finds its own uses for things, right? This is not unlike with COVID in the early days of, of video visits, right? Where, you know, iChat was never invented with healthcare in mind, but all of a sudden there was a need for video visits and the existing technology often was lacking. So like, oh, I'll just, I'll just use iChat, mm -hmm. right? And so, so it's interesting how people adopt technology to their needs, which is often unanticipated by the developers of the technology. And so I, like, I just like how he thinks about how people interact with technology. So I, I think it'd be a fascinating dinner conversation. Definitely. Yeah, that's you, awesome. I, I had to ask a follow-up. Like, do you have a favorite science fiction film? Ooh, probably... Yeah, there's so many, but the fifth element, oh, yeah. that's a great Bruce Willis, just yeah. because it's hilarious. Yeah, that's great. Question four, question three, I guess this is technically the fourth question now, but <laughs> would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? So this one's super easy. I would not want the ability to, be, to read people's minds because I, I can sometimes not even figure out my own mind. <laughs> that would be terrible. I'd want super speed mm. because speed is time. Right. Super speed lets you cut out the tedious parts of the day that are and lets you get more stuff done faster. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the one thing that none of us have enough of is time. So mm -hmm. so for me, super speed would be great. Yep. Love it. Question four or five, technically, what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? I think people are, are very amused that in healthcare, we still use pagers and we still use faxes. <laughs> like. You know, here we are on a technology podcast talking about AI and machine learning and all these advances, and, and yet our providers are still carrying around pagers and our offices are still insisting on faxing stuff on paper. That that's, gets back to that sort of the future is here, but not evenly distributed. Mm. Like the past is still here, but not evenly yeah. distributed. Right? We have these the remnants that we're just unwilling to let go of. So true. Last question that we have, if you could travel back in time to any event or moment, what would it be and why? Uh, that's a really, really hard one. Uh, I, I think it would, it would be the moon landing because mm -hmm. yeah, you can, you know, a very geeky person, but I think the space program, the NASA program in particular, sort of epitomized what can be accomplished with a, a focused will, right? If people really want to get something done, we can figure out how to do it. And that was at a time when the technology was really crude. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, 50 years later, we still haven't replicated that. And there were tons of spinoff benefits. And I know lots of people are naysayers about the space program. It's like, let's fix all our problems on Earth. But that's zero sum thinking, right? I think there are a lot of technologies have lots of ancillary benefits. And so there's, and, and I think space travel's neat. So the moon landing would probably be it. But there's, you know, again, so many events in history that would be interesting. Hard, hard to pick. No, definitely. It's funny. I think we've had three people, three guests now say the moon landing. And I, I totally understand that. So 
That's and, awesome. and by the way, Keith, all three of you were in the fish bowl at the Chai and Fall Forum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. Yeah. I don't know what's going on in Chai, but everyone loves the moment. It's, it's, right. I think it's a, it's a self-selected population who goes to those kinds of meetings. Right? <laughs> yeah, so, Probably, uh, that's funny. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Keith, for taking the time to share some of your wisdom with us on our show. Everybody listening, you can find Keith on Twitter at K Welchie or K W O E L T J E. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Digital Patient, hosted by Seamless MD. You can follow us on Twitter at SeamlessMD. And if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, you can visit www.seamless.md. Keith, again, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.